Om Yata Vini Mayor Yatra Tri Sargo Mesha Damna Srina Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Param Dimahi O oh my Lord Shri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva, O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead, oh, from our respectful basis is unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes, of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations in the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Purjita Kaitravotra Paramo Nirmatsananam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimba Purir Ishwaraha Sadyohide Avarudhite Tra Kriti Bihi Sususubhistakshana Completely rejecting all material activities, all spiritual activities, all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity, is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpaturur kalitam falam sukumakad amrita dravi samyutam pibata bhagavatam rasamalayam muhur ahoraska buvibhavakaha O oh, expert and thoughtful man, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. Mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sisukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Even though its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Hidyantak Stohi Badrani Vidunati Srihitsatam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear about, about him directly through the Bhagavad Gita.
is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart, becomes a best wishing friend, and pure or acts as a best wishing friend, and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu bhadresu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati is some of Thomas Loke bhakti bhavati naistiki. In this way, the devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about the Bhagavatam from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are, are, are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha Bhagavat Tattva Vigyanam Mukta Sangha Sijayate When these purity and when these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Bidyate Hridaya Grantis Siddhyante Savasam Saya Siyante Chashyakarmani Trista Evatmanishwari Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the heart not of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage with some Sayam Samagram. Understanding of the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16, Verse Numbers 13 to 15. Tatra Tatro Pasrinvana Swapur Vesam Mahatmanam Pragiyamanam Chayasa Krishna Mahatmya Suchakam Atmanam Cha Parichat Tratam Parichatam Avas Amno Stratejasa Sneham Cha Vishni Partanam Te Sam Bhaktim Cha Keshave Te Bhya Paramasantusta Prit Urj Prit Urj Drim Bita Luchana Maha Danami Danani Vasamsi Dado Haran Mahamanaha Translation by Srila Prabhupada Wherever the king visited he continuously heard the glories of his great forefathers who were all devotees of the Lord and also of the glorious acts of Lord Krishna. He also heard how he himself had been protected by the Lord from the powerful heat of the weapon of Aswatthama. People also mentioned the great affection between the descendants of Rishni and Prita due to the latter's great devotion 
the Lord Krishna. The Lord Keshava. The king, being very pleased with the singers of such glories, opened his eyes in great satisfaction. Out of magnanimity, he was pleased to award them very valuable necklaces and clothing. Purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Kings and great personalities of the state are presented with welcome addresses. This is a system from time immemorial. And Maharaja Rikshit, since he was one of the well-known emperors of the world, was also presented with addresses of welcome in all parts of the world as he visited those places. The subject matter of those welcome addresses was Krishna. Krishna means Krishna and his eternal devotees, as the king means the king and his confidential associates. Krishna and his unalloyed devotees cannot be separated, and therefore glorifying the devotee means glorifying the Lord vice and vice versa. Maharaj Pariksit would not have been glad to hear about the glories of his forefathers like Maharaj Yudhisthira and Arjuna had they not been connected with the acts of Lord Krishna. The Lord descends specifically to deliver his devotees, Parijanayam Sadhunam. The devotees are glorified by the presence of the Lord because they cannot live for a moment without the presence of the Lord and his different energies. The Lord is present for the devotee by his acts and glories, and therefore Maharaj Pariksit felt the presence of the Lord when he was glorified by his acts, especially when he was saved by the Lord in the womb of his mother. The devotees of the Lord are never in danger, but in the material world, which is full of dangers at every step, the devotees are apparently placed into dangerous positions, and when they are saved by the Lord, the Lord is glorified. Lord Krishna would not have been glorified as the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita had his devotees like the Pandavas not been entangled in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. All such acts of the Lord were mentioned in the addresses of welcome. And Maharaj Prikshit, in full satisfaction, rewarded those who presented such addresses. The difference between the presentation of welcome addresses today and in those days is that formally, the welcome addresses were presented to a person like Maharaj Pariksit. The welcome addresses were full of facts and figures. And those who presented such addresses were sufficiently rewarded, whereas in the present days, the welcome addresses are presented not always with factual statements, but to please the post holder. And often they are full of flattering lies. And rarely are those who present such welcome addresses rewarded by the poor receiver. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So the arrival of Maharaj uh, uh, Krikshit in different places uh, was always welcomed because he was a, a devotee, and at the same time, he was the king. So that's the formula for success. Being a devotee leader who is qualified to make the right decisions so that the people remain happy and cooperative, and work together cooperatively. So that's the nature of the spiritual world. Everyone is cooperating to please Krishna. So when Krishna is the center of activity and people work sincerely, there's great harmony and consensus understanding of where everyone is going. If you become doubtful of where you're going and you're not convinced that the strategy to get there is right, then you're going to protest. But if you're convinced that the goal is right, the strategy to reach the goal is right, the leaders are, are rightfully situated and you trust them, then there's no anxiety and you go straight forward with your work and you cooperate and you judge from the result. Uh, that's the principle of Krishna consciousness. You judge from the result. You, judge, you don't judge by speculation. You judge from the result. 
So the result should be that there's uh, happy cooperation, and that can only happen when there is Krishna in the center and regular hearing. Just like we chant this mantra every day, Srinvataswa Kata Krishna. And at the end of the uh, uh, translation, it says, Therefore, only by hearing from Krishna, from his devotees in Krishna consciousness, can one understand the science of Krishna. So the science of Krishna, that's not a uh, euphemism. It's a fact. This Krishna consciousness is a science. But what does it mean by the word science? It means that it's true in all places at all times. It's not true simply in a certain reference frame. But everywhere you go, the same truth is there, that we're all subordinate to Krishna, and that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that our real position is to be his eternal servant, surrendered to him. And so all these things are factual. Everywhere you go in the universe, it's a fact. It's not that it's only here or there or only in India and not in the West. It's everywhere. So this is transcendental knowledge. It's above the influence of the modes of material nature. It's not tempered by uh, events that take place. It's always the bottom line truth about life. So uh, there are some interesting statements uh, in the uh, in the Bhagavad Gita in this respect. Let me just take a look. It says the conception of God as some ruling power or as the interpersonal Brahman can be reached by persons who are in the inferior energy of the Lord. But the personality of God it cannot be conceived unless one is in the transcendental position. And this is a very important statement because unless we rise above the influence and modes of material nature, we will never understand Krishna properly. As long as we remain influenced by lust and, uh, and ignorance, uh, it's impossible to understand Krishna. Even in the mode of goodness, one only begins to understand. But one is not clearly, uh, one, one does not grasp Krishna consciousness clearly. One must rise above the mode of goodness, the transcendental goodness, through regular and slow practice of Krishna consciousness by hearing every day and repeating and associating with good devotees engaged in devotional service, then one may rise above the influence of the modes of material nature and begin to understand Krishna factually. <clears throat> uh, so, therefore, he says, the conception of God, uh, he says, but the personality of God cannot be, Godhead cannot be conceived unless one is in the transcendental position. Now, there's more about this um, in the Bhagavad Gita again, where it says, the more one hears about the Supreme God, the more one becomes fixed in devotional service. One should always hear about the Lord in the association of devotees. That will enhance one's devotional service. Discourses in the society of devotees can take place only among those who are really anxious to be in Krishna consciousness. Others cannot take part in such discourses. The Lord clearly tells Arjuna that because Arjuna is very dear to him, for his benefit, such discourses are taking place. So this is 10th chapter of the first verse. Buyo eva mahabaho shrinume paramam vacha yate ham priyamanaya Krishna says, listen again, O my dear Aunt Arjuna, because you are my dear friend. For your benefit, I shall speak to you further, giving knowledge that is better than what I've already explained. So, 
two points in this verse are very important. Sri Nume Paramam Vacha. He says, um, he says, Sri Nume, listen to me. This uh, uh, about this supreme instruction. And then he says, Yateham Priyamanaya. And I'm speaking it for your benefit because you're my dear friend. Now, how do you become a dear friend of Krishna? How do you become a dear friend of anybody? You offer them service. And by offering service sincerely without any selfishness, one becomes endeared. And and the other person wants to reciprocate. Just like Maharaj Brikshit, uh, when he hears the uh, glorification of Krishna and his forefathers, he gives gifts to the persons that speak so uh, eloquently and sincerely and correctly, factually. So... And Prabhupada also explains it's possible to speak to God. It's a very interesting point. And he says in the 15th chapter, he says, uh, so he says, the following information is there in the Madhyan Dinayana Shruti. And it quotes a long verse, Savai Esa, Brahmanista, Idam, Sariram, Martyam, and so forth. It is said here that when a living entity gives up his material embodiment and enters into the spiritual world, he revives his spiritual body, and in his spiritual body he can see the Supreme Personality Godhead face to face. He can hear and speak to him face to face, and he can understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead as he is. So, this is, a, this, is, this is like promise. This is something that's actually going to happen. It's not a fantasy. Krishna is a, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He, there is such a thing as the spiritual world, like Kunta and Goloka, and you can go there. You can go there. But because Krishna is very kind, and because our eyes are so blind, he appears in a deity form. And you can speak to him by offering beautiful prayers and, and beautiful bhajans, and dance for him, and offer him food, and, and receive back his, his the prasadam, his mercy. So, uh, this is a very special thing uh, that most people don't understand. You know, if you if you go into a, a Protestant church, there's no uh, there are no deities. Sometimes there's no pictures even of Jesus. It's just the Bible. That's it. You go into a Sikh temple, there's only the Granth Sahib. You go into a Baha'i temple, there's nothing. There's an empty space. <laughs> You see, it gets more and more impersonal. And you go into a, a Muslim mosque, uh, there's, there's just the Quran, that's it. And there's a lot of uh, uh, beautiful designs, but no picture of God, no, no picture of Muhammad, nothing like that. Right? So it's a special thing to be able to understand God personally. Uh, even great people like Einstein, they're absolutely convinced there's no personal God because they're still under the, under the influence of the modes of ignorance and, and uh, passion. And if there is any goodness, it's, it's, it's very mundane goodness. There's nothing transcendental. So again, uh, Prabhupada says another very interesting thing. He says that One second. There are many great statements by Prabhupada in the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, he says, yeah. 
Sakya tonan yaya sakya ham evan bir duruyucuna gyatım drastum çıtat vena pravestum çal parantapa. He says it's my dear Arjuna, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you and can thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you enter into the mysteries of my understanding. So Prabhupada explains in the purport, Krishna can be understood only by the process of undivided devotional service. He explicitly explains this in this verse so that unauthorized commentators who try to understand Bhagavad Gita by the speculative process will know that they are simply wasting their time. Now, I want to read to you an example of speculative uh, unauthorized commentator. This is, uh, this is Einstein. He says, uh, well, it's said about him first, and then he quotes, and then it's quoted. Einstein expressed his skepticism regarding the existence of an anthropomorphic God, such as the God of Abrahamic religions, often describing this view as naive and childlike. In a 1947 letter, he stated, it seems to me, that's, that means speculation, it appears, I think, or I stink, you know, it seems to me. These are all uh, introduction to speculation, meaning nonsense. He says, it seems to me that the idea of a personal God is an anthropological concept which I cannot take seriously. In a letter to Beatrice Froelich on 17th December 1952, Einstein said, stated, the idea of a personal God is quite alien to me and seems even naive. Now, this is supposed to be the greatest scientist in modern times, right? But he's the greatest dunce when it comes to understanding anything about Krishna. You know what a dunce is? It means a person who's extremely stupid, right? And he's trying to pre he was a preacher. He was trying to convince people that his conception of this anthropological God is the right conception. And because he was such a prominent scientist, many people believed him. So here Prabhupada's saying, no one can understand Krishna or how he came from parents in a four-handed form and at once changed himself into a two-handed form. These things are very difficult to understand by the study of the Vedas or by philosophical speculation. Well, that's why Einstein, if he read the Vedas, he only read the Bible, he didn't read the Vedas, but he found that the, the Bible was naive and childish, right? It had a bunch of, uh, in, had a bunch of stories that were naive and childish. Well, what would he have said about this? God appears with four hands, and then he changes into two hands. He would have said exactly the same thing. It seems to me that the idea of a personal God is an anthropological concept which I cannot take seriously. The idea of a personal God is quite alien to me and seems even naive. So, the, therefore, who should we trust? Who should we trust to receive our information about, uh, from? This is a major question that we should ask ourselves. Many people are trusting so many books so many books are being written. You go to Barnes and Noble, thousands and thousands of books, right? And most of them are rubbish, trash. There's only a, one book that's Srimad Bhagavad Gita by, by, with Prabhupada's purports and the extension of that book called Srimad Bhagavatam and the further expansion called Chaitanya Charitamrita and Nectar of Devotion that are valid. All the other books are speculative. I have not seen any other book. If there's some book that's based on Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, that's okay. But most books, all those thousands and thousands of books in libraries are all speculation. They're a waste of time reading them. <clears throat> so, therefore, it is clearly stated here that no one can see him, meaning Krishna, or enter into understanding of these matters. Those who, however, are very experienced, 
students of Vedic literature can learn about him from the Vedic literature in so many ways. There are so many rules and regulations, and if one at all wants to understand Krishna, he must follow the regulative principles described in the authoritative literature. So, someone asked me yesterday, they said, uh, Prabhu, you know, I chant my rounds, but sometimes these very strange thoughts come into my mind, and uh, uh, I, I, I feel attracted to them. Can you explain why this is happening? I said, well, I can't explain anything for myself, but I can tell you what Prabhupada says. He says, someone who doesn't follow regulative principles, the mind plays tricks on them. So if a person is not strictly following the regulative principles, your mind is going to play tricks on you. And those tricks are vicious. And you begin to dream and think of all kinds of things that are very, very strange and, and actually illicit. So, Prabhupada's answer is the correct answer. We should be very careful about following the regulative principles of Krishna consciousness, and we should be very careful of associating with people who don't follow it. And that can be a devotee or that can be a materialist karmi. We should only associate with people who strictly follow the regulative principles. Otherwise, your mind will play tricks on you. So then Prabhupada continues, he, said, he says, For example, to undergo serious penances, one may observe fasting on Janmasthami, the day on which Krishna appeared. And on the two days of Akadasi, the 11th day after the new moon and the 11th day after the full moon. As far as charity is concerned, it is plain that charity should be given to the devotees of Krishna who are engaged in his devotional service to spread the Krishna philosophy or Krishna consciousness throughout the world. Krishna consciousness is a benediction to humanity. Lord Chaitanya was appreciated by Rupa Goswami as the most munificent, or meaning generous, man of charity because love of Krishna, which is very difficult to achieve, was distributed freely by him. So this should be our real vocation in life, spreading Krishna consciousness. It's not that I have to start a business to make money. Uh, yeah, everyone who's married has to earn money honestly. But our real business should be spreading Krishna consciousness. Uh, and and uh, Lord Chaitanya said, Bharata Bhumi Te Manushya Hailas Jan Makar Jan Masartak Karikara Para Upakar. Anyone who's born in India, their duty is Para Upakar, doing good to others. And how do you do that? It's by Krishna Upadesh, explaining to people who is Krishna and how to please Krishna and how to serve Krishna. See, these are, these, this is the real subject for discussion and for dissemination, dissemination. So if one gives some amount of money to persons involved in distributing Krishna consciousness, that charity given to spread Krishna consciousness is the greatest charity in the world. And if one worships as prescribed in the temple, in the temples in India, there's always some statue, usually of Vishnu or Krishna. That is a chance to progress by offering worship and respect to the Supreme Personality Godhead. For the beginners in devotional service to the Lord, temple worship is essential. And this is confirmed in the Vedas, Vedic literature, Svita Svitaru Upanishad 623, Yasya Devi Para Bhakti Yata Devi Tata Kuru, Taishyaite Katita Hiyartak Prakasante Mahatmana. One who has unflinching devotion for the Supreme Lord and is directed by the spiritual master in whom he has similar unflinching faith, he can see the Supreme Personality of Godhead by revelation. Now, let's think about this. Everything is based in Krishna consciousness and Bhagavad Gita on revelation. Now, what does revelation mean? Well, Tene Brahma Hridaya Adikavaye Muyanti Yat Surayaha. That's what revelation means. That this beautiful Bhagavatam was, was revealed to the heart of Brahma by Krishna. That is revelation. So, this is confirmed second in the fourth chapter. 11th verse, where it says, 
Yayatamam Padyante Tons the Taiva Pajam Yaham Mamavart Manavartante Manashya Partha Sarva Saha. As one surrenders unto me, I proportionately reveal myself. In a, in a letter to uh, Tejas Das, May 20th, 1970, Prabhupada said, The Lord will reveal himself to you in proportion to your sincere efforts to satisfy him only. That Why does he say him only? Because it says, Sarvadharmam Pritya Mam Ekam Saranam Raja. It says, uh, give up all your uh, dharmas, meaning fabricated dharmas, and surrender only unto me. It doesn't say uh, that uh, Sarva Deva. It doesn't say Sarva Deva. It says Mam Ekam, only unto me. It doesn't say all. De offer your devotion to all the devas. He said, only unto me. It's exclusive. Now, this is very interesting. Some people would say, oh, this is fanaticism. It's not. Because you can respect the devas by offering them Krishna Prasad. But you should offer all your love and devotion to Krishna. And Krishna says, Mom, it come. It's a very hard statement. Uh, the the Muslim it's harder than what the Muslims say. They say, "Allah Wahad Shirik La Illahu." They say, "God is one. There's not two gods, and and we are all uh, His children, or we're all surrendered to Him." But Krishna says, "You surrender only to Me." So it's much stronger even than what the Muslims say. So here, and then Prabhupada also uh, quoted quotes in the. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 8, 17. The Lord reciprocates the dependence of the devotee. So what does that mean? That means that devotees depend completely on the mercy of the Lord. That's another thing. They don't rely on anybody else's mercy. They just depend on the mercy of the Lord that comes through the disciplic succession and through bona fide guru. And then in another, uh, in the introduction of Srimad Bhagavatam, Srinivar Bhagavatam, Lord uh, Prabhupada says, Lord responds to the proportion of the devotee's love for him. So therefore, Krishna is going to reveal himself to the degree we surrender to him. And surrender means engaging in devotional service sincerely and cooperatively. So these are some points I wanted to discuss today. Are there any questions about the purport? or the points. Hare Krishna. Yeah. I have a general question. In, in our mind offense, the instruct the faithless person about the holy name. Yeah. Has that a Faithless means like the one who just doesn't believe or just the one who counteracts on your... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have to say this into the microphone so that people that are listening uh, on the internet can hear. Hare Krishna Maharaj Yes. Um, uh, in my question is... Uh, in the ninth offense is the instruct the instruct the faithless person about the holy name. Yeah. So does this uh, faithless means the person who just doesn't believe on the God itself totally, or the one who counteract on what we say always? Means uh, why is it so? Yeah. yeah, I understand what you mean. Well. See, if, you're, if you've read the uh, 14th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, very important chapter to read, it explains the three modes of material nature. So when you meet someone, if you've read the 14th chapter carefully, you can find out in about 30 seconds to one minute how that person is situated. 
to what mode of nature they're situated in. If they're situated in a mode of ignorance, it's almost impossible for that sort of person to understand anything. So you have to be very careful with such people. If they're in the mixed mode of ignorance and passion, again, it's, they can hardly understand anything. If they're completely in the mode of passion, uh, you have to understand that they're greedy, they're lusty, and they're only interested in making money in order to have sense gratification. Okay? But they're active. Those people are very active. They're always doing something, you know. And usually they don't want to waste their time hearing about something spiritual. Unless their business is doing bad. Then they might be interested. <laughs> So, but then if you meet someone in the mode of goodness, they have curiosity. See? So you're, you as a preacher, the first thing is you have to decide, you know, where, where, where is this person or this group of people situated in? And then based on that correct diagnosis of their degree of uh, influence under the modes of material nature, you have to give them something that they may understand that may catch their interest, right? Now, what you don't want to do is, is uh, give them an overload of information. They won't be able to understand. You have to give them something that catches their interest. Just like Krishna stopped, uh, what was his name? Rikasura, was it Rikasura? Yeah, who was going to kill Lord Shiva. He stopped him by saying something about uh, his body. He said, you know, why are you running so fast? You know, you, you might have a heart attack. You know, and he put a doubt in Rikasura's mind. He said, you actually believe what, you know, what Lord Shiva said? So he stopped him by putting a doubt in his mind and saying something that showed in a sense to Rik Rikasura that he was interested in his body because all the materialists have are interested in their body and in their own benefit. So you have to say something that's going to pique the interest of people either in the mode of ignorance or in the mode of passion. People in the mode of goodness, are in, they, they're usually inquisitive about Krishna or consciousness or spirituality. Right? So it's easier to talk to them. So if you're not expert enough to speak to the people in ignorance and passion, then you just offer them prasadam and a smile, right? Or give them a free pamphlet about Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> so why? Why is this? Because, and Prabhupada says, Therefore, the highest benefit one can render to human society is relieving one's neighbor from all material problems. In such a way, a pure devotee is engaged in the service of the Lord. Now we can imagine how merciful Krishna is to those engaged in his service, risking everything for him. Therefore, it is certain that such persons must reach the supreme planet after leaving the body. Okay? So, this risking everything for the Lord, that's the symptom of a real devotee. Just like Prabhupada risked everything to come to the United States in his advanced age. He was like 70 years old. He had two heart attacks on the boat. He had a, uh, he had a, like a, a mini stroke in New York City. Almost killed him. He had to go to the hospital. And, then, and, he, and if you read his letters at that time, he was very, very sick. And he went back to India to try and uh, get better. So uh, this uh, Krishna consciousness is all about sacrifice. Sacrifice everything to please Krishna. So therefore devotees, in a sense, are more merciful than the Lord. This is explained. Let me see where it gives. It says 329. Um, 96. Yeah. Ignorant men think of the body as the self. 
They accept bodily connections with others as kinmanship, the land in which the body is obtained as their object of worship. And they consider the formalities of religious rituals to be ends in themselves. Social work, nationalism, and altruism are some of the activities for such materially designated people. Under the spell of such designations, they are always busy in the material field. For them, spiritual realization is a myth. And so they are not interested. Those who are enlightened in spiritual life, however, should not try to agitate such materially engrossed persons. Better to prosecute one's own spiritual activities silently. Such bewildered persons may be engaged in such primary moral principles of life as nonviolence and similar and materially benevolent work. Men who are ignorant cannot appreciate activities in Krishna consciousness, and therefore Lord Krishna advises us not to disturb them and simply waste valuable time. But the devotees of the Lord are more kind than the Lord because they understand the purpose of the Lord. Consequently, they undertake all kinds of risks, even to the point of approaching ignorant men to try to engage them in the acts of Krishna consciousness, which are absolutely necessary for the human being. So you can see Prabhupada was, uh, well, the devotees are more kind than the Lord. The Lord's saying, don't waste your time with these people. But the devotee, knowing what the purpose of the Lord is, he will try and approach such people, but with knowledge of the modes of material nature, right? And offer them something that can help them make some spiritual advancement. So we did that yesterday. We took our food truck to Tacoma, to the Asian Pacific Cultural Center. This is the Vedic Cultural Center, right? They have the Asian, Asian Pacific Cultural Center, right? And Asian Pacific people eat meat like big time. And the Asian Pacific people are big, you know, they're like this, you know. And, <laughs> and their favorite food is pig. They'll take a big pig and put them on a skewer and they roast them and they eat the whole thing, every part of it, right? So, but they invited us and uh, we went and we fed them. And many of the people said, We've never, we, we don't like vegetarian food, but this is the first time we've tasted vegetarian food that we actually like. <laughs> was, it, was anyone there yesterday that's here? No, okay. Yeah, the, I mean, uh, uh, Mukunda Prabhu was there, and Ananda Prabhu was there, and, uh, oh, wait a minute, Bak, Bakta Dhananjaya. Uh, what did you hear yesterday? They were crazy with food. I think they were very happy with it. Yeah, and there were some really big people there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, gigantic. Yeah. The, the, there was one guy there. He looked like a sumo wrestler. You know what a sumo wrestler is? They, they, they're like this. They're like gigantic. He had the biggest stomach I've ever seen in my life. Right? And, and it was so heavy that he had to sort of lean on something, you know, most of the time. <laughs> but he, he ate the prashana, he liked it, and, and his, I think it was sister or his mother or someone, she was also huge. When I showed her the plate of prashana, immediately her eyes went on the purple halva. She said, what's that? <laughs> she, she like it was like a bee going to honey. She what she she intrinsically felt that there was something there. There was a vibration of that purple halva, you know. <laughs> and and then when she started eating, she ate the halva first, and she liked it like anything. You know, she said, "How did you make this thing?" You know. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience yesterday, and they want us back. On a regular basis. You know, it's a whole new world. Anyway, Prabhupada says that the devotees of the Lord are more kind than the Lord because they understand the purpose of the Lord. Consequently, they undertake all kinds of risks, even to the point of approaching ignorant men 
to try to engage them in the acts of Krishna consciousness, which are absolutely necessary for the human being. So yesterday, this lady uh, was doing her best to get people to come, right? It's the first time we're there. We did serve over 70 people or 70 places. So anyway, she called up one person that she knows, and that person came, and they wanted 11 plates because the mother and father came. They have nine kids. So they took 11 plates, right? And, and the lady kept saying, and it's vegetarian. The others were like, what? Vegetarian? You know, you sure about this? You know, and she said, oh, no, no, it's very good. You have to take it. You know, this lady was like a devotee, like she was convincing people to take prasadam. You know? So these people took the prasadam. Later on, they called up the lady and they said, this is the first time we ever ate vegetarian food that we like. She said, and it was so good, we made a mistake. Instead of taking 11 plates, we should have taken 22. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. <laughs> I mean, yesterday was an amazing experience. Right? So anyway, we have to take risks to spread this movement. We have to take risks. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, about uh, just on top of his question about preaching to the uh, fellows people now you have some people who knows already about Krishna or Krishna consciousness especially among Indians our Indian people and when you devotees there you know you know taking trouble to preach to explain Krishna consciousness, said oh don't tell me about that I know no, I know no. so now He's faithful or faithless because he said he knows the microphone. About, he knows about Krishna, but he does want somebody to tell him about Krishna. So, I, what kind of person is that? Well, it's a person who says, "I know all this," right? In other words, they say, "You don't don't talk to me. I I know all this," right. which means I know nothing. <laughs> That's what it really means. I know nothing. <laughs> but uh, you have to make friends with people like that. See, it's just like... Some they're really arrogant. They don't even... No, I know. Well, they're, if they're really arrogant, then, you know, you just give them some prasadam if they'll take it and, and leave it at that. But uh, have you ever gone fishing? Well, I can't remember experience of fishing. Maybe when I was a little... Yeah. Well, anyway, if you... Before you go fishing here in America, they have these specialized stores for getting fishing uh, paraphernalia. And in these stores is a huge wall of uh, uh, bait, mm -hmm. but they're artificial baits, right? And, and they're extremely beautiful. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's like a little fish, but yeah. it's, it's shiny and, and it's decorated. And, you know, I mean, some of them is ex extremely cre creative, right? Now, why do they do that? Because fish, all they do is think about eating. They're, you know, you ever, you ever see these fish, you know, in an aquarium, the, their mouth is going <laughs> all the time. You know, the mouth is opening, closing. They're, they're always looking for something to eat. Now, they have eyes, and these, these baits are made to attract them. Say. So, like, you know, usually you think, well, you go fishing, you put a worm on the, on the, on the, on the thing, you just throw it in. Yeah. yeah, but no, they have these creative baits now that, you know, yeah. even, even we are attracted to them. Let's put it like that. Yeah, yeah they're very pre pretty. So you have to say something to people like this, like the Indians, oh, I know all this, you know. Uh, you have to say something that catches their attention. You know, so a smile, how are you doing, you know, speaking nicely to them and so forth, and saying some little joke, you know, and, uh, and then make, you know, they, they, you say, where you come from? They say, oh, from Gujarat. So, oh, uh, and you say, uh, uh, Kim Cho, you know, in Gujarati, how are you? And they, they smile, oh, you speak Gujarati? I say, well, I know a few words. <laughs> <laughs> so now you made friends with them, see? Because you said something that they, you know, and they do the same thing like, uh, what's his name? Uh, 
Vaisha Sheka. Years ago, he used to be in the airport in San Francisco almost every day. And uh, most of the people coming in were Japanese. So he learned how to say a few words in Japanese just to stop them. You know, how'd you want to, you know, oh, you speak Japanese, you know. <laughs> they thought he was like uh, working for the airport, right? And then they end up with buying books. Right? So you have to know how to stop you. That's the first thing you have to learn how to do to make to, to do book distribution, you have to know how to stop a person by saying something that catches their attention or, or is part of their culture, right? And so first you make friends, just like you want to raise funds. Well, the first, the first uh, step of fundraising is friend raising. You don't just raise funds from people. You have to make friends first, right? And there's a saying, ask for money, you get advice. Ask for advice, you'll get money. <laughs> so that's, that's a trick. I, I, I did this once with this one man. He's, he's a very wealthy guy, a very difficult person, very difficult to get money from. So I called him up one day and I said, uh, oh, I, I need to get some of your advice. I said, really? He said, yeah. So okay, you can come and see me. <laughs> so I went to see him four, four times without asking for any money. And every time, you know, he gave me some advice, I'd go and I'd try and implement it and I'd come back and give him a report. And then he'd give me some more advice, I'd go and come back. At the, on the fourth time, I asked him for money, he got really, you know, uptight, you know. But, you know, I kept saying, but he told me to do this and I did that and he told me to do that, I did that. And then, you know, finally he gave some money. <laughs> If I had gone the first time and just asked for money, he wouldn't have given me a penny. He would tell me to get out. So you have to make friends with people. Okay. Adibo. Okay.